So this is lecture four for the anthropology of Asia. We're going to talk about Alpashas in the shadows of the state. You will recall from the beginning of the course that we have a number of different goals here. And one of the goals that we have is what we call information literacy. It's a general education goal that is independent, if you will, of any of this content of the anthropology of Asia. So information literacy itself is very, very important. We learn to uh, read and write. We learn to decipher text and construct text. We learn to do that critically and so on. But at the same time, this kind of literacy is, is broader than learning to, to read and write. It's also learning to think critically, right, about written, published documents and so on, uh, where our information about the world comes from. To be literate in this sense is to be able to think critically about how we know what we know about the world. I think it's important maybe at this point in the discussion to kind of now look back at uh, the last few lectures. And if you think about this geographical and anthropological information that we've been discussing, well, generally speaking, that is widely accepted knowledge. That is, it's information or knowledge that um, is widely accepted or shared by many people. But that's not all information. All information isn't just this body of accepted um, ideas, accepted facts, and so on. And in anthropology, we're about to turn our attention to what we call ethnographic text. So it's a particular kind of text. If you think about anthropology as a discipline, we have different kinds of texts. You may have had an anthropology course in the past and you've looked at a, a textbook, let's say. Uh, you may have noticed that we don't have a textbook uh, for this particular course because we are really focused on the ethnography of the region. That's a particular kind of information. And so as we be try to become more information literate, it's important for you to reflect upon how the information we're about to look at, the ideas that we're about to look at, are different from those ideas introduced in the last few lectures. This is part of the goal in the class is to do this kind of comparison and contrast right among different kinds of forms of information or different kinds of texts. So at this point, we're turning to your required reading for this unit, In the Shadows of the State by Alpasha, Indigenous Politics, Environmentalism, and Insurgency in Jharkhand, India. And I have mentioned that this is an ethnographic text. And so what is an ethnographic text? Well, literally, ethnos, uh, a people, a group of people, like an ethnic group, and graphic, like um, the, the notion of writing. So a, a written text about a group of people. So what I think is more important about ethnography or ethnographic text is really the kind of methods that they are based in or based on. Anthropologists, particularly cultural anthropologists, uh, believe that there is a method to gain a better understanding of groups of people. And it entails doing long-term field work where you learn the language of a community and you spend approximately one year, that's kind of the, the minimum of uh, kind of a long-term field work that would uh, ethnography could be based upon, so you know the language, you spend a lot of time in that community, you do what we call participant observation, which is not just kind of fly on the wall, wall direct observation, but you establish yourself in the community. You gain people's trust. You develop social relations with, social relationships with people. You spend a lot of time with them. And you kind of get an inside view of their way of life or the particular question or problem that you're looking at. But it's kind of that insider participatory perspective that's unique to anthropology. And I think as you, as you, you know, look at the, the lecture, you view the lecture, listen to the lecture and read the text, you can kind of see the difference in understanding, the richness, right, of the understanding that comes out of this kind of research method. So the author is Alpa Shah, and she is a, a, a widely recognized and widely respected anthropologist in our discipline. She teaches at the London School of Economics, one of the world's 
best universities. And she conducted ethnographic fieldwork in Tapu. So this is in Jharkhan, and it is actually just southwest of the state capital. And her research focused on the Munda people, but not just in this general sense, like, so what is Munda culture? Uh, in fact, she explores questions about how state and other kinds of interventions into Munda communities, interventions that are focused on their group rights, have had really complicated consequences. She argues that the very state discourses of kind of majorities and minorities, if you think back to this uh, previous lectures that we had, actually reinforces inequality rather than challenging it, right? So this is an interesting text. It's exploring interesting questions, and it really does say something to this bigger question or problem we are exploring about multiculturalism, liberal multiculturalism, right, and its application to the peoples and societies in Asia. So let's look at this. So Jharkhand province, we've actually spoken about uh, in the component on geography, and we talked about North and Northeast India. And you can see on the map there, it is highlighted in, in red, the missing white chunk from that Northeast area of Indi India, as you know by now, is Bangladesh. And it's an interesting province because it's a new province. Uh, it hasn't always been um, Jharkhand. In fact, uh, it is recently independent from the province to the north. And you can see the kind of the line, right, that separates Jharkhand, the red province, from that, the gray province to the north. And they share that boundary or border. Well, it was independent from Bihar because of indigenous or minority rights movements that advocated for greater autonomy for peoples like the Munda. So the province to the north of Jharkhand is known as Bihar, and it's in a tremendously populous province. And one of the problems was that uh, in Jharkhand, you have a lower population density and you have a greater number of tribal peoples, peoples, um, Aravasi peoples like the, the Munda. And when there was one particular province, the large number of the Hindu majority in the north, in Bihar, often would overwhelm, right, in terms of like, let's say, uh, policy voting, voting for a particular policy initiative. It disad the actual political boundaries, right, of Bihar that incorporated those tribal peoples really did undermine the rights of indigenous peoples. And so the idea was once Jharkhand was independent from Bihar, then the actual votes of tribal peoples like the Munda would have more power, would have more capacity. The actual political province of Jharkhand could better represent Munda rights. Now what Alpasha is going to argue though is that there's a catch here because the independent Jharkhand still seems to be monopolized by the upper Hindu castes. So even though there was an independence movement and Jharkhand became independent, well, there's still this relationship of the Indian state being dominated or monopolized by uh, upper Hindu castes. And what she argues is that when you look closely at what's happening, if you look closely at what's occurring, that upper Hindu castes, they represent Munda really for their own economic and political interests. So it's not the case that the indigenous rights movement or the minority rights movement is simply represented by selfless individuals um, who struggled, right, for independence solely on the behalf of the economic and political interest of the Munda, that there is more going on, right, to some of these movements for groups like the Munda. While the independence of Jharkhand and the province itself sees a lot of celebration of Munda traditional culture, on the other hand, there is this, this uh, dilemma whereby Alpa Shah is making the argument that politicians and elites co-opt, right, those multicultural and indigenous rights discourses. So the ethnography of Tapu, let's talk a little bit about this. Tapu, as we mentioned, was a, is a town in, in Jharkhand. You can see 
Tapu represented there in the, the image. And it's a really diverse community. So Tapu, we looked at the demographics of the, the town. About 20% of the village is actually um, the majority Hindu ethnic group. And so twenty percent of the village is of two different Hindu castes, the Sadan and Yadav castes. You have another forty percent of the town that are different scheduled tribes and castes, so the minority caste as well as other kinds of scheduled tribes. Sixty percent of the town is actually not Munda. 40% of the town is, is Munda. And that is important if we're going to understand uh, the kind of politics, right, and economics of multiculturalism, that this is a diverse community. It's not just a, a Munda community. If we look at the, the details, we do have an agricultural village setting that she's describing in line with what we kind of said about Munda culture more, more generally. But there is a, a lot of out-migration. The basics was that, yes, it is an agricultural village like we had talked about, um, but there is a lot of out-migration at this point. Uh, people are leaving Tapu for other areas, and in particular in this community, brick factories and quar quarries are absorbing a lot of, of labor. A lot of Munda are moving out um, to work in brick factories and quarries. And one of the things she points out is, despite, let's say, the independence of Jharkhand and the government's celebration of Adivasi, celebration of tribal culture, uh, celebration of traditional kinds of culture, that when Alpa Shah is speaking with people there in Tapu, many do not want to live a traditional lifestyle. Um, many people would like some of the modern standard of living that this community in many ways has been excluded for. So as, as a kind of disempowered, marginalized community in many ways in, in, in India, um, they've been excluded from some of the development, right, that India has seen in the contemporary period. And Munda, when you talk with them, they want a share, right, of that development. You know, rather than if you just, just listen to the the um, indigenous rights leaders and the government leaders celebrating cultural diversity um, and kind of celebrating the traditional lifestyles of Munda, Munda are very interested in other kinds of, of lifestyles. And that tension, I think, is important in her text. So some of the main ideas we're seeing in, in the text. Well, generally speaking, indigenous rights movements have not really led to concrete improvements in the lives of the Munda were other Adivasis for, for that part. And there's a couple different reasons for that. The first is she's, she makes the argument, um, Dr. Shah, that there's a lot of corruption. So even with independence, we've mentioned that there is the uh, maintenance of power by upper caste Hindu um, majority. And that the, although they are advocating for indigenous rights, their political positionality allows them to seize the resources that the Indian central government sort of channels to Jharkhand for the in indigenous peoples, for minority peoples, for maintaining traditional culture and so on. That because of this, simply their positionality there, they can seize those resources. If uh, you know 100% uh, of the resources comes to Jharkhand, well, from the provincial level, you only may see 80% that goes down to the next level of government. And elites at that level will take another, you know, seize another chunk of those resources. And then you only have 60% going down. And so when we get down to the, the top who level, there is significantly less resources available than had originally been earmarked for them. Alpasha is also making the argument that local lives are being undermined by many of the provincial level initiatives that argue that, as you've seen from our discussion of, of um, Munda culture, the role of uh, trees, individual trees, but also forest and forest groves, that when the indigenous rights leaders, they celebrate Munda's relationship with nature and they talk about the Munda being close to nature, and they want to conserve nature to help the Munda, 
that in fact, that doesn't always lead to any kind of improvement in Munda lives. In fact, she's going to make uh, quite a bit of observations and analysis that this has led to increasing conflict in Munda communities, particularly between Munda and wildlife like elephants that have been attracted to these new conservation areas established by the Jharkhand provincial government. And in fact, uh, the, the rise of things like elephant populations due to conservation initiatives and policy lead to the destruction of Munda crops, the destruction of Munda houses and so on. And this is something that's being done in their name when through ethnography and getting down to this local level, participating in people's lives and talking with people at a ground level, we can see that it has what you might even call unintended consequences. And kind of a third point here uh, for what Alpa Shah is saying that we don't see an improvement in the lives of people is kind of further related to this kind of idealization of the Munda that happens. So, you know, if, if we're going to do a short, like, I want to introduce you to, to Munda culture, we're going to simplify it. We're going to reduce it quite a bit when we do that. And when you build policy and you build politics around that, right, it has complicated outcomes. So one of the other dimensions of this has been this criticism in the province on kind of tribal people's out migration, uh, tribal people's movement to quarries and things like the brick factories, because the idea of traditional Munda would be what they continue to maintain their crops, right? They continue to stay in that one particular place. They maintain their religion, right? They don't convert to other religions or they don't abandon their religion. Yet that, those are ideas about Munda culture. Those are ideas not divorced from Munda culture, but the reality of in time, real life, lived experience of the Munda far more complex, right, than those ideas. And when those ideas are used, those simplistic ideas are used to formulate policy, it can have negative consequences. It could lead to the stigmatization, right, of things that they are doing to improve their own lives. Rather than the provincial government supporting the Munda to achieve what they want to achieve, in fact, they're working at cross-purposes. Another important part of this book is the discussion she, she has about insurgency um, in Munda communities and in, more broadly in, in tribal communities in North and Northeast India. So in this part of the world, in South Asia, and includes other states across the border, let's say in Nepal, there are groups of people known as Nakshalites, and they are a also a very um, non-homogenous group, a very heterogeneous group, lots of different groups that all, don't always share um, identities or share uh, ideologies. But there are some commonalities. If we look at groups like the Maoist Communist Center, Party Unity, and People's War Group, all of these groups just have a kind of a general class-based revolutionary liberatory goal. So these are people that are often very vocally struggling for the liberation of tribal peoples. They are struggling for the liberation of people like the Munda, who they see um, as having been oppressed and discriminated against by upper class and upper caste Hindu uh, majority. And they very vocally are struggling on the behalf of tribal peoples for their liberation, right? for them to have their fair access to the resources of the country. So in many ways, the insurgents are allies with indigenous rights activists. But again, even in a such a clear example of struggling on behalf of indigenous peoples, of criticism of the state, right? We have talked about the existing critique among the Munda of right, the Indian state here, and Jharkhand, let's say, and the, the politics. And here's a group of people actively using, picking up arms against the state, if you will. And this should be also something that would be aligned with the interest of the Munda from what we've, we've seen so far. 
But again, on the ground, we have observations that it's simply not that simple. The group's own elite members, um, that is, the, the leaders of many of these groups, are not lower class or lower caste people. They're often not necessarily tribal peoples. And so you have, just like at the level of the Jharkhand province, you have this movement struggling on behalf of Munda that's not always representative of Munda people. These groups often have uh, ideology, political ideology, you know, serving underclasses and serving lower classes, for example. But they also have moral ideologies about things like the consumption of alcohol or, let's say, uh, sexual relationships outside of marriage and the family and so on. Now, these ideologies are not Munda ideologies, but because they are struggling on the behalf of peoples like the Munda and other tribals, these ideologies do come to impact Munda people who don't share those ideologies necessarily. And so here is another group of people saying that they're struggling for the Munda who begin to work at cross purposes, right? With the moral values and moral ideologies of, of the Munda. She shows how the use of intimidation, the use of violence, the idea that they are going to protect Munda people as long as Munda people are on their side and support them and so on, that they, they, they add a whole nother layer of oppression. Even though they are saying they are struggling, right, for, for the Munda, it's a whole nother layer of kind of um, disempowerment and oppression. So there's cases, right, where Munda are being intimidated themselves. They're being, they're either in fear of or have been targeted by violence. And they need to play the game of, well, if they want to work with the state, they want to uh, gain some kind of contract for the state, because it's the state, they have to kind of go through some of these militant groups or risk having violence, having aggression and so on. And so this, in her view, right, no, this is not a clear solution. It's not that the insurgents, right, are resolving the problems or solving the problems. They're complicating things in their own way. One of the final things I think that she, she rightly observes is the way that with the independence of Jharkhand and discourses about how the Hindu majority pursue their own interests, right, at the expense of the Munda, that in, in some ways these groups, in their attacking the state, they just further create this schism, right, between Munda people who are not being adequately represented by the state or served by the state, right, rather than closing the schism, rather than getting better Munda representation in, in the state, rather than eliminating corruption, you don't have anything like that, right? You have a further schism. In fact, the groups are with protection for contracts and so on. They're in, 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 in fact a kind of criminal element that just furthers the corruption that's already there. So in conclusion, to kind of recap, so we've moved from those generalities, the sort of encyclopedic understanding of uh, minority issues in, in India. And we've really started getting into the ethnographic research, if you will, on the Munda community in Jharkhand. And one of the things that Alpa Shah is adding to the discussion for us is that these indigenous rights movements, so group rights movements that do follow what we've been arguing is a kind of liberal multiculturalism, that um, there's this kind of complex relationship of those movements and their consequences, their outcomes, right? Their impacts and the relationship of the lived experience of Munda people. We're left with this question, right, of the degree to which indigenous rights movements really make tangible improvements in Munda people's lives.